So, good, good morning, um, everyone. Welcome to our August Grand Rounds. I'm actually pleased to see the room mostly filling up. Uh, August is always a difficult time, I think, with uh, people ending their vacations and things like that. Um, but before Neil Swordlow gives a, a formal introduction, I wanted to personally uh, welcome uh, Professor Young and um, his uh, topic on um, uh, empathy, bonding, uh, uh, et cetera, will overlap nicely actually with an emerging area of interest in our department as we discussed yesterday in the area of social cognition. So, so that's very nice. And if I may be permitted a, uh, a lame kind of joke, it is that you uh, are the embodiment of uh, empathy and desire to bond by being here when you could have watched the almost total eclipse of the sun uh, back in uh, in Atlanta. So, so thank you for, uh, for for being so socially aware <laughs> and being here with us today. But Neil, give a serious introduction. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our departmental grand rounds. Uh, Dr. Larry Young is the William Timmy Professor in the Department of Psychiatry at Emory University. He's director of the Center for Translational Social Neuroscience and the Silvio O'Conti Center for Oxytocin and Social Cognition. He's the chief of the Division of Behavioral Neuroscience and Psychiatric Disorders at the Yerkes National Primate Research Center and also the new director of the Center for Social Networks at the University of Tsukuba in Japan. Dr. Young completed his BS in biochemistry at the University of Georgia, a PhD in zoology from the University of Texas at Austin, and a postdoctoral fellowship under Thomas Insel at Emory University before joining the Emory faculty in 1996. Dr. Young's research focuses on the neurobiology and neuroendocrinology of social behavior. He's published over 225 papers, reviews, and chapters on this topic with three articles topping 1,000 citations each. His work has been recognized with many honors, including the Daniel Efron Award from the ACNP and with election as fellow in the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He sits on many editorial boards as member or associate editor, including biological psychiatry. Perhaps most impressively, Dr. Young has served as primary PhD thesis advisor for 19 grad students and as a research mentor for 12 postdocs and 49 undergraduate students. Dr. Young authored a book entitled The Chemistry Between Us, Love, Sex, and the Science of Attraction, published by Penguin Press in 2012. Today he'll speak to us about the neurobiology of social bonding, social loss, and empathy, implications for autism. Please join me in a warm welcome for our Grand Round speaker, Dr. Larry Young. Thank you, Neil, uh, for that introduction. And uh, I want to thank Igor for making it possible for me to come here. And also Jennifer, I don't know if she's in here, but for helping me get around and organizing everything. Um, so I'm going to talk about the work that I've been doing for the last 23 years or so at Emory on the neurobiology of social relationships. And I think all of you, you know, especially if you're psychiatrists, you know how important social relationships really are. Um, and all of you, no matter what you do, know that social relationships can be uh, very critical in our life and, and be exhilarating when we begin a social relationship, for example, have a child or fall in love. And it can be debil debilitating uh, when those relationships are broken. And so we are able to kind of study that using an animal model that I'll tell you about um, in just a minute. So I want to give you a little warning first, though. But I'm in a department of psychiatry, but actually my roots are in biochemistry of behavior and basic science from the very beginning. I wanted to understand how you go from genes and diversity in genes to brain neurochemistry that gives rise to differences in behavior. And uh, most of my work is, is done in animals, and then I'll bring it back around to humans and psychiatry in the end. So these are the guys that I study. I don't study your normal lab mice and rats. The, I study these prairie voles. These guys are wild, outbred animals. And uh, as cute as they look, if you pick one up, they'll bite the crap out of you. Uh, they're pretty vicious. Um, but what makes them cool is that, first of all, they're very highly social. They crave social contact. And in the wild, a male and a female will come together. The male will court the female. And if the female likes that male after a short amount of time, she will let him mate with her. And then when they mate, there's a transformation that occurs in both of their brains so that from then on, they want to be together. 
they nest together. She has the babies. The male is right there. He spends just as much time licking and grooming the babies as she does. This is very unusual. Only about 3% of mammals exhibit this kind of behavior. Humans exhibit this kind of behavior as well. Uh, in the wild, most of these guys, if they lose their partner, about 80% of them never take on another partner. They can take another partner, but you got to remember a prairie bull's life is only a few months in the wild because, you know, they're known as the potato chips of the prairies, you know, because they, they basically feed, <laughs> feed a lot of other, other animals. So, uh, but for most of their life, for example, they pretty much stay with one partner. So what is interesting to me is that, you know, 3% of mammals have this kind of behavior, but those 3% are all not related. It has something to do with their ecology. So there must be something in the brain that allows for this new behavior to evolve independently multiple times. And so this is what I was trying to think about. How can you evolve a new behavior like this? Um, so what I'm going to, what I believe is, is that monogamy, which is very unusual, evolved from acceptation or the tweaking of neural circuitry that are present in all mammals that um, cause mothers to give uh, nurturing and a bonding with their babies. And since that bonding circuitry already exists, you can somehow tweak it a little bit so that in context outside of giving birth, maybe sex, you can have a bonding experience with another individual. And um, I, so far, I think that that theory seems to be, there's a lot of evidence for that. And why do I say that? And I think you know my talk is about oxytocin today. Oxytocin is a molecule that uh, first was known for its role in giving, uh, in la inducing labor. It causes uterus contractions. Um, after the babies are born, it's, caused, it's released from the brain and it causes the muscles to contract in the breast to mimic milk ejection. But um, importantly, in the, in the rat, it transforms the mother's behavior so that she wants to be a mother. Okay, so you take a virgin female rat, put pups in the cage. Those pups stink and they squeal and they're just annoying and the female will go try to bury those pups and eventually if they don't shut up, she will probably kill them and eat them. Okay, but if you take a mother who has gone through the experience, the hormones of birth, which you can ex you know, give exogenously, then suddenly those aversive stimuli become incredibly attractive and irresistible. In fact, there was an experiment done back in the 60s where they had a, a, a paradigm where a, a female could, uh, after she had given birth, could press a lever to get pups to come down her chute. And she would press the lever and she would get 200 or 300 pups to come down that chute. So they are very uh, reinforcing at that stage. And Cord Peterson, you know, uh, back in 1979 or so, thought, well, oxytocin is involved in giving birth. Maybe the same molecule is involved in just transformation of the behavior. And he injected oxytocin into the brain of virgins and found that suddenly they would start begin to pick up pups. Um, now, rats and mice are promiscuously maternal. They don't really bond with any individual pup. They bond with their nests because pups can't walk around, so anybody in that nest has got to be theirs. Um, Keith Kendrick and Barry Caverne studied sheep, and this is a little bit different situation. Not only has the female sheep have to want to take care of lambs and find lambs irresistible, but they live in a herd. There's a breeding season. Lots of females are giving birth at the same time. So the mother not only has to say lambs are adorable, but the mother has to say my lamb is adorable. And that bonding happens. That learning of the scent and the face of the baby occurs within the first few minutes of birth. And that uh, they found that if you took a female who was not pregnant um, and show her a lamb, she would butt the lamb away. But if you infuse oxytocin into the brain, she would actually adopt that lamb. You know, that lamb would become hers, even if she wasn't able to produce milk. Um, so that oxytocin is well known from the 80s as a bonding molecule. Now I'm going to go back to the voles and this pair bond between adults. Uh, we have a very simple test that was devised by Sue Carter in the uh, early 90s, where basically you put the animals together and you can allow them to mate or you can prevent them from mating. You can vary the amount of time that they are together. You can infuse drugs, um, do all kinds of you do optogenetics, all kinds of things um, during this learning period. So we think of this as, as a kind of a social learning. They have to perceive the cues of the partner and then make some kind of memory. And then you can you separate them so they're not in contact for a period of time. And then you give them a choice. So here I'm uh, illustrating the female as has a choice. We take the male partner. He has a little collar around his neck. He's tethered to this cage so he can wander around here, but he can't go out. Take a novel male, put him on this side, and the female is in the middle, and she has to choose where to spend her time. 
we give them three hours. We have these 12 cages sitting on the floor with a computer. Each computer is focused on three cages, and it follows the animals, and then it spits out the data in a spreadsheet. And it only counts the amount of time that the two animals are sitting next to each other huddling. Okay, so not fighting, but huddling. And we say that they have a partner preference if they spend twice as much time with the partner than the stranger. Um, of course, we can do this test in a male, too. So this male in the center here spent last night with that female, and they successfully populated. He's never seen this female. And uh, in most, um, most mammals, actually, so the uh, rodents and, I'm sorry, mice and rats, for example, would actually prefer the novel female, given the choice. Um, so he, male voles not only develop a bond towards their partner, they develop aggression towards other voles that are not their partner. It's called selective aggression. And so he tussles with her, you're not my partner. And he comes over, and this is what we will score, this amount of time that they're sitting together. So you can see it's a very clear difference you know, once they bond, um, the kind of behavior that we uh, look at. So um, <clears throat> Sue and Tom together, well, Sue initiated it, but she didn't know how to do infusions into the brain. But So she hooked up with Tom Hensel, and they did some infusions in the brain. Because oxytocin doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. So it's given you know, IV to induce labor as Pitocin. Pitocin is exactly oxytocin, uh, but it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. So she had to cannulate them, and then she, they took uh, females and with no mating, so six hours of cohabitation with a male, infused either CSF or OT, and found that if you give them uh, oxytocin, the females, if, you know, if their brains were bathed in oxytocin and they were around the male, even if they didn't mate, they would develop this pair bond, this partner preference. Um, and then they showed that if you block the oxytocin receptors, and, and then you allow them to mate, the, the CSF animals form a pair bond, but blocking oxytocin receptors prevents this mating-induced pair bond. So that just shows you that the endogenous oxytocin system uh, is involved. Now about this time is when I graduate, graduated with my PhD, and uh, I got really excited about this model because of the fact that there's not only prairie voles, which are very highly social, socially monogamous, and biparental, but there are other species of voles that live in different habitats. They're different species, but they look the same. And these guys are basically solitary. They prefer to spend their time alone um, until they want to get together to have sex, but then they split. Uh, these, the mothers uh, have their babies, and about 10 to 14 days after having the babies, they abandon the babies. And they're just totally different in terms of their social behavior, but their outside appearance is very similar. So I thought it was a great opportunity to sort of study in the brain and the genome what is different in, in individuals that have a lot of social competency. So they can form relationships very easily, and they want to engage with others versus one who naturally don't. Now, so don't, don't think of these guys as being autistic, because this is the behavior that is most adaptive for them, uh, for, their, for their lifestyle, for their uh, environment. So they're just two different kinds of behaviors. So um, first thing we thought, well, prairie voles must have more oxytocin than meadow voles. So we slice the brain and stain for oxytocin. And we see they both have the same amount of oxytocin. And the fibers in the brain are exactly the same. Um, so then we decided to look at the receptors. So this is receptor autoradiography, and the dark areas show you where receptors are, and actually there are tremendous differences in the brain of where the receptors are. The receptor itself, the protein is the same between the two species. What's different is where in the brain that receptor is distributed and where it's expressed. And I'm just showing you one slice where there's a remarkable difference, and this is the, uh, an area called the nucleus accumbens, part of the striatum. This is a part of the brain where dopamine is involved in reward reinforcement, learning, reinforcement learning, um, addiction, things like that. Uh, prairie voles have a lot there. Metal voles have very little. Prefrontal cortex I'll also talk about is very important. Um, so we thought, well, maybe since these areas are involved in reward and reinforcement and bonding must be has something to do with that, maybe this is where oxytocin receptors are involved in the pair bonding process. So we, we put uh, infused uh, an antagonist into either the prefrontal cortex or the nucleus accumbens. And we found if we blocked any one of those two areas, the animals would mate just fine. It would not inhibit mating. But after mating, they did not form a bond. So this is how we began to identify the places where oxytocin was acting. Now you've got a molecule, we've got a place, two places. 
If we put the same drug into an adjacent area, the same amount of drug, it does not block the pair bonding. So we know this is not diffusing to a distant area. So we've identified the places. Now, uh, I want to say a bit about what oxytocin does generally, because this is a very special case. This pair bonding is a very special case. It, like I said, pair bonding only occurs in about 3% of mammals. So what does oxytocin really do? What is the fundamental process that oxytocin does? Um, and I, we did some experiments back in, in the mid, late 90s where we had oxytocin knockout mice. And then later we had oxytocin receptor knockout mice. And we see what was wrong with them. And we were looking at males here. Um, Several things were, they were different in, but I just want to make this point here. We did a social recognition paradigm where we would take the experimental animal and expose them to a novel animal and quantify how long they took to sniff each other, or how long the experimental animal sniffed the novel animal. And what happens if you do this over and over and over with a 10 minute interval, uh, they habituate to that animal. First time they sniff for about a minute, and then each time you put them in there, they sort of habituate. Um, then you put a new animal in there and they go up. And what we find is this is wild type real data. They habituate a novel animal. The knockouts never habituate. Now you could say, so that means that they see that individual as a novel individual even though they've seen it. Um, so it does, it, or it could mean they can't smell or they can't remember. And um, that doesn't seem to be the case because if we sent uh, the stimulus animal with lemon scent or almond scent, a non-social cue, both the wild types and the knockouts can habituate to that just fine. So what this means is that you know, mice tell each other apart by smell. The smell is very complex, and every mouse smells different, just like every one of you has a different face. Although I might not remember you tomorrow in this big room, unless I've talked to you, had dinner with you last night, or something like that. Um, so. Um, it seems that what oxytocin is doing is making the animal be able to pay attention to the complex complexities of the odor that makes individuals unique. So my story here is that oxytocin enhances the salience of social information. Okay, we'll get back to that later when I talk about autism. So um, the chemistry of the pair bond. Oxytocin is just one molecule that's doing something, and what I'm think is that oxytocin is helping in the perception and the processing of high integrity information about the individual, the identity of individual across the brain. Then you, we also know that if you block dopamine receptors, the animals do not pair bond. They will mate, but they don't form a pair bond afterwards. This work done by Sushin Wang at Florida State University. And we have shown, as well as um, others have shown, that if you block the mu opioid receptor, the animals will mate, but they don't form the bond. So it's really a chemical cocktail that creates a bond. So oxytocin is not the bonding molecule. Oxytocin is social perception molecule. And combined in the case of mating, sex, in this particular paradigm, with the dopamine and the opiates and the context, it all leads to a pair bond. And so this is sort of my model, my view of what oxytocin, or, or what is happening in the brain when an animal develops a pair bond. Um, well, first let's say what happens when an animal mates. Let's say this is a mat, a rat. Okay, A rat mates, but it doesn't form a pair bond. Or you take a virgin male rat, put, give him an estrus, estrus female. He knows that he should do something. It's very exciting to him. He tries various things, and then eventually he gets the right position, and he successfully intermits. And that somatosensory information comes in and activates the VTA midbrain dopamine area, which then causes release of, oxy of dopamine into the prefrontal cortex, the nucleus accumbens, ventral pallidum, and the male says, wow, that was great. And uh, he spends the rest of his life trying to recreate that biochemical event. And he says, wow, who was I with? I was with a female, and she smells like estrus. So I'm going to look for females in estrus. Okay, Prairie voles have the same experience, but because they have this high density of this receptor that's involved in the perception of individuals. They have a higher resolution neural signature of what who they were with. They released that oxytocin. The, gas, the, the, the prairie vole says, wow, who was that? And then they want to spend their time with that individual. So another way to visualize this is this is your non-monogamous rat. He has sex. And the important parts of his brain, like the nucleus accumbens that are helping him learn what to do, 
uh, are receiving this information, wow, this is a female in estrus. It's not a male, it's a female in estrus, and I'm going to search for the females in estrus in the future. The prairie vole, uh, because it has these high densities of oxytocin receptors that are helping it identify the individual, is getting a little bit higher resolution information about who they are with. And so the, the actual neural encoding of the individual, the uniqueness of the individual, gets stamped into the reward system through synaptic plasticity, I think maybe in the mid discumbents. So I hope to figure out how that works one day. Um, but we know a lot, a lot of stuff. And I'm going to tell you about some stuff that we've done uh, recently. This is a study published last year. We just, my graduate student who just wanted to know what brain areas are activated when animals mate if you block the oxytocin receptor, right? So he did a FOSS experiment. He cannulated these guys, let them mate, um, and then separated them for, for 90 minutes to let the FOSS be expressed. And then he quantified areas and areas that he called the social neural network. So these are areas like the anterior olfactory nucleus, the medial amygdala, things that process olfactory information, but then all the way to the nucleus of Cummins and prefrontal cortex. And at first he was kind of disappointed. Well, he did the behavior and showed that in males, um, blocking oxytocin receptor prevents pair bonding. Um, this, we used to think oxytocin only worked in females, but now we know oxytocin does the same thing in males. Uh, there's a whole vasopressin story in males that I'm not going to talk about today because it's less relevant to autism. Um, but uh, when he did this, but he looked at the brain areas and we were hoping to see some areas might not be activated if you block oxytocin receptors. And it turns out that's not the case. So these are just animals that are sitting in a cage by themselves. These are animals that got CSF and mated, and these guys got OTA and mated, and there were no group differences across these areas. So the conclusion was mating activates a lot of brain areas in voles. Um, but when he looked at the data a little bit differently, because we've been reading papers about functional connectivity and oxytocin affecting how areas were connected to each other, he did correlation analysis to look at how correlated the activity was across different brain areas. And uh, so this is a correlation matrix. This is the animals that were unexposed. And if you correlate, say, the amount of expression in the PFC, the amount of FOSS in the PFC, versus and the amount of uh, in the medial amygdala, and these animals are not correlated. Basically, none of, these animals, none of these areas are correlated. If you let the animals mate and allow oxytocin to flow, so they just get CSF, Boom, all the areas have become highly coordinated in their activity. So the prefrontal cortex is activated, the medial amygdala is activated, um, and across the board, all these areas have become activated. But if you block oxytocin receptors, they suddenly become decorrelated again. And this is a kind of a simple, old school kind of experiment, but I think it tells you, you know, you can look at a lot of different brain areas that what oxytocin is doing is helping the coordination of communication across the brain areas from the area where the social information comes in, decision-making network, all of, into the nucleus of common. So it's allowing the social information to be processed correctly. Um, this is a little bit more sophisticated one. This is a Nature paper that came out in June this year, um, where we didn't use FOSS, but we used uh, electrophysiological recordings to record. We put electrodes in the prefrontal cortex and the nucleus accumbens. We had this little neurologger on top of their head. And this does not inhibit mating. The male doesn't care if the female has one of these things on their head. Um, so, um, so we can actually quantify. We, we were interested in this coordinated activity, or actually here we can say more precisely coherence. Because areas can be oscillate. We we're looking at LFPs, and they can oscillate at different frequencies, or they can come together. And when they come together, that means one is controlling the other. And so uh, Lizanne Amade, who just defended uh, earlier this spring, put the probes in here. And then she looked at periods of time. And purple is when they mate. And then these are, uh, I guess, self-grooming and other things. And what she found is that when they mate, so the magic time when the pair bond is being formed, right, the neural activity and everything is happening that's making a pair bond, she saw a lot of coherence between the prefrontal cortex and the nucleus accumbens. And when she did the math about the timing, she could figure out that the, the, uh, the signal was coming from the nucleus accumbens and it was going to the, sorry, it was coming from the prelimic cortex and going to the nucleus accumbens. So the prelimic cortex was controlling the nucleus accumbens. 
And this is in theta frequency. So this is the frequency of oscillations of long distance communication across different brain areas. Um, but she looked at it a little bit more carefully. And um, so within the nucleus of Cummins, there's also a gamma, a high frequency oscillation. And what's happening is that the prefrontal cortex is modulating the amplitude of the gamma, so which is the local communication in the nucleus accumbens. So uh, it's, it's making it the, the height, the amplitude of the gamma go up and down under the control of the prefrontal cortex. And what was cool about this is that there's, you know, prairie voles are outbred. There's a lot of individual variation in behavior and stuff. Um, what she found was that if you let them mate and then you look at how long does that take after mating before these guys start sitting next to each other, the expression of the bond. There was a very strong correlation between the huddling and the control of the prefrontal cortex to the nucleus accumbens. So how coupled was the prefrontal cortex to the nucleus accumbens de determined how quickly they would form a pair bond. Okay? So individuals seemed to differ. Even before they ever made it, there were differences in how tightly they could control those two areas are connected. And that predicted how quickly they pair bonded. So this is a very nice correlation. But uh, of course, we wanted to call, show causation. So we designed an experiment, uh, optogenetic experiment, where uh, she was an engineer. So she built this cage and computer program laser system where um, the male was in a cup, and the female subject was able to walk around. And the computer watched it. And whenever the female came next to the male, they would stimulate channel rhodopsin, which was um, uh, channel rhodopsin was injected into the excitatory neurons of the prelimbic cortex that project down to the nucleus accumbens. And then we used the laser to excite the terminals from the prefrontal cortex when she was around that male, like what happens when they have sex, and at the same theta frequency, so theta frequency as we saw in mating. So we recapitulated this one little part of the brain's neurocircuitry, its activity during mating, to see if that could create a pair bond and indeed, uh, we could induce a pair bond optogenetically just by activating this circuit. So <clears throat> I really like this paper because we started out by knowing a molecule. Then we went to know some brain areas. And now we know something about the dynamic uh, neural communication at you know, a really millisecond kind of time scale. And now we're going beyond this um, and putting, in, uh, area, uh, putting electrodes in the, in the uh, basal lateral amygdala. Because what I think is happening here is that this control at these peaks is at the when those nucleus accumbens neurons are at the height of sensitivity to input. The prelimbic cortex also projects to the basolateral amygdala, which sends in the odor information, the identity information. And if the prelimbic cortex, which is kind of executive function kind of thing, sort of saying this is a good context, it will control these two areas so that maximal sensitivity, so that that individual really gets ingrained into the nucleus accumbens based on this kind of timing. So that's just a hypothesis for the next five years of my grant if it gets funded. If it doesn't get funding, I won't do it. OK, um, <clears throat> I'll tell you a little bit different story now. Uh, this is, has, I think you can see the implications for psychiatry. One of my students was interested in how early life experience influences the ability to form uh, relationships later in life. And so what she did was study these little guys. And she did a classic um, social isolation paradigm. For three hours per day, only three hours per day, she put them in these little social isolation chambers. They couldn't see each other. And this was in an incubator, so they weren't cold um, for two weeks of their life. So for the first two weeks of life, they had this experience for social isolation. They get weaned at 21 days. Some animals did not get this isolation. Those were the control groups. And then she looked to see if they could form pair bonds later in life. And she found that uh, control groups formed, after 48 hours cohabitation, formed nice, strong partner preference. Spend much more time with the partner than a stranger. But the ones that got the early life separation, as a group, this was no longer statistically significant. There's a trend there, but there does seem to be some impairment. But when she looked at the data, we also classify individuals, did you form a pair bond, spend twice as much time with the partner or not? Uh, she found that some individuals were actually were very good at forming partner preferences here, and some individuals were not. Okay? 
Why could that, what could cause that? There was this other phenomenon that we have, um, I've noticed in the lab for all, many years, and that is that among prairie voles, they're not, they don't all have the same neurochemistry. Different prairie voles, this is an outbred colony, have um, high densities of oxytocin receptors in the nucleus accumbens, and others have more than metal voles, but lower levels. So this is, you can see the spread of how much oxytocin receptors are in this triatum, even though in other brain areas, they're absolutely identical. So for some reason, there's like a huge individual variation in how much receptor is in the nucleus accumbens, and therefore how sensitive it is to oxytocin. And uh, when she divided up animals into high and low, uh, she found that the animals that had the high densities of receptors were totally resilient to this early life uh, neglect. Um, the ones that had the low levels of receptors were totally susceptible to this early life neglect. And what we think is happening, yeah, what we think is happening is that uh, when the, after these three hours and we put them back with the mom and dad, the mom and dad licks and grooms them a lot and we know that that activates the oxytocin system because we can do stroke them with a paintbrush like the mother licks them and OT neurons become activated. Um, but you can imagine that this guy, when, that, when the mother licks them after coming back, gets a lot more stimulation than this guy. And that suggests to me that oxytocin early in development has helped building that social brain, that social network that influences how they can relate to other people later in life. And there's uh, evidence that the same thing may be happening in people. This is uh, work done by Ruth Feldman's group in Israel, where she um, had fathers, brought in fathers, um, and who had six-month-old babies, and gave them intranasal. So intranasal oxytocin apparently can cross the blood-brain barrier to some extent and have some effect, and I'll talk about that later. But either gave them in intranasal oxytocin or intranasal placebo, and then told them to engage with their child. And they found that the fathers that got the oxytocin actually got more eye-to-eye -eye contact, more reciprocal interactions with the baby than the fathers that got placebo. But what was really incredible is that they measured oxytocin in the saliva of the fathers who got placebo when they played with their child and the fathers who got intranasal oxytocin. And of course, if you sniff oxytocin, you're going to have a lot in your saliva. But what was amazing was is that when they looked at the babies, the babies whose father got intranasal oxytocin had no increase in oxytocin during that interaction. Uh, but the, the babies who got, whose father got oxytocin and therefore got all of that uh, contact uh, had a big re um, surge in oxytocin in their saliva. So that suggests that parenting, you know, sort of um, really social interaction can activate the oxytocin system in babies. And so we, um, there's a review, if you're interested in this topic, we've published this review in Science in 2014 that basically synthesizes both the animal and the human literature on this topic. And uh, basically when, you, when, the, when parents give birth, uh, ox oxytocin is released. It activates this sort of reward response that so now babies are so cute you know I've, so many mothers when they give birth they, they show pictures of their baby and they say it's the cutest baby ever in the world and that's because they got oxytocin even no matter what the baby looks like you know and then um, but it quietens down areas that make crying aversive and it increases activation this is fMRI studies of empathy and that causes this parental engagement and that causes this oxytocin release and then it um, it helps develop the neural circuits in the child's brain so that they can uh, become mentally, mentally healthy, securely attached adults, and it goes in cycles. And of course, there's genetic influences that might influence how this uh, works. Um, and I'm going to show you an example of that now. So remember I told you this high and the low expression in the nucleus accumbens. This was something that really fascinated me because I'm really interested in my heart you know, from the beginning in how does diversity come about? How do you get changes in DNA? that can create diversity in the brain that gives rise to diversity in behavior. Well, it turns out, I'll just, long story short, whole thesis, thesis um, we found that there is a polymorphism in the oxytocin receptor gene that predicts 80% of the variation in expression. Probably the rest of it, some of it, the 20% left over might be experience and it might be error in quantification and the assay and everything, but is incredibly robust. So these animals are siblings. They come from CT parents. Um, and CT parents have one quarter CC offspring and one quarter TT offspring. And just because of the SNP that they inherit, 
it influences the expression of receptor in the nucleus accumbens, uh, but not in any other brain area. Very specific polymorphism in the intron that doesn't, it's not affecting the coding, but somehow a SNP is um, affecting expression. It also affects how quickly they can pair bond. And then the, I just showed you about the early life experience. Now, this is the uh, easy version. Uh, actually, uh, it's a little bit more complicated because in my colony, there is about nine SNPs that are all in complete LD. I can't find anybody, any vole in my colony that has a C here that doesn't have a T here and a G here. So really, they all are sort of equally probable. But the reason that I'm focusing on this one is because when we align this to the mouse and look at the encode data, um, so well, well, first let me let me just I'm going to make this point. So behavioral genetics is fraught with non-replication, right? So you see an effect, but then nobody can replicate it. And let's just show you how robust this is. This is just three different replications. We have many more independent replications of uh, TT, CT, and CCs, and you can see in each of these cases there's absolutely no overlap in the expression. So we have a phenotype here that's related to a SNP that is incredibly robust, and this allows us to like you know go in and try to see you know in psychiatric genetics how is it that a SNP that's not in a coding region affect a behavior. But the reason that we're interested in this one in particular is, is if you look at the brain encode data from mouse, this is the olfactory bulb. No, this is whole brain. This is olfactory bulb. This step falls in a peak of CTCF binding sites, and there's also little peaks of markers of enhancers, and none of the other peaks fall in that area. So my, my next grant is actually to do this, all this chip and ACAC and all that, and the nucleus accumbens and other areas in the bowl, areas that don't express a receptor or areas that do express it, but not depending on the phenotype, and then we can get an idea of the transcriptional landscape of the gene, and then start doing things like, uh, well, we're, well, we got wild animals, Went out to the wild, catch a bunch of wild animals, try to break up that like it's just its equilibrium, doing chip in these areas. But we also now have CRISPR working in voles, and so um, I have a grant actually to go in and change the low expression to a high expression just to edit that one SNP, and that way we can demonstrate for sure that this gene is involved in that process. So now I want to switch gears a little bit um, and talk about some a couple different behaviors that we've been able to study. Uh, this is um, work that was done in collaboration with uh, Franz de Waal, who studies mostly chimpanzees, but he's always likes to write books about, you know, um, how animal minds and how uh, you can see, you know, the evolutionary antecedents to behaviors like love or empathy in animals. And uh, we did this experiment. So my thinking was is that prairie voles are monogamous, and uh, they live in uh, families where the, there's a breeding female who's always pregnant. Basically, she's always pregnant. Okay, females give birth, they mate that day, or she's always pregnant. So, from the male's perspective, he's she's incubating his babies. So he should develop a behavior that if she's distressed, he should harm her. Right. So we wanted to we call we would call that consolation, and we develop this paradigm where we take animals that are paired and we either, we either take the female out and give her a little time away from the male. She's probably relaxing a little bit, based on what my wife says. Um, or we, or we give her a little foot shock, not you know, just foot shock and a tone to kind of freak her out a little bit. So it's like she had a stressful day at work, and uh, we'll put them back together, and we'll see if this movie works. Quantified the behavior in the male. So this male here, the female just was had a little time away from the male. And this one, the female was stressed. And you can see um, this guy just says, hey, how you doing? And then he goes on about exploring that cage. But this guy can recognize that something's going on. And he spends a lot of time actually grooming her. And that grooming actually reduces her anxiety on an elevated plus maze. Um, and actually, if he is not able to groom her but just to see her, his court levels match her court levels. Um, we did a lot of things to show that it, it qualifies as like, as empathy related. Um, I won't go into all that details, but um, so this is the behave quantified behavior. Turns out it's not just mates. Siblings do it too. Any of you have children know that in a household, if one sibling is stressed out, the mom's stressed out, and everybody's stressed out. So yeah. um, they don't do it to strangers. OK? 
Okay, so it's specific for there's a familiarity bias. They have to know the individual. So it's not just just responding, automatic responding to a scent. It is, I know you, I see something is distressing you, and I'm going to do something about it. Maybe they're not thinking that, but that's what their neurochemistry and their neural circuits are making them do. Uh, metal voles could give a crap if their partner is stressed out. It just doesn't matter. All he cares, are you in estrus or not? Um, so oxytocin has been implicated in humans in empathy. Um, and so we, and of course, mother rats, maternal behavior is all about empathy. It's all about when a baby is crying with ultrasonic vocalizations, detecting it, going to get it, bringing it back, and comforting it. So this kind of empathy is like really it's something that's present in all animals. And, and that's oxytocin dependent. So we, we, we injected ICV oxytocin and found that indeed blocking oxytocin receptors, the, male, the males would not care then. Either they didn't detect she was in distress or just they were not motivated to do it. Um, then we looked at um, brain areas. So there had been some lots of uh, uh, studies showing that the anterior cingulate cortex and the insula are involved in empathy like, or actually response to pain. Uh, if you see someone else getting stabbed, uh, you activate these kinds of areas. Um, I talked to somebody about that yesterday. Um, but but we, we saw the same kind of activation pattern when um, we did FOSS, where the animal could see their partner, the partner being in distress but didn't do anything about it, or even if they could do something about it, they found the anterior cingulate cortex being activated. And indeed, these guys, if we block in the anterior cingulate cortex, the animals do not show this consoling behavior. If you block in the prelimbic cortex, which we know is involved in pair bonding, they do show it. So again, we've got a new, another brain area where actually the, the, in the human, this area seems to be important for empathy. And now in voles, the same area seems to be important. In humans, oxytocin seems to be important for maternal behavior or parental care. In voles, oxytocin is involved. One last paradigm, and then I'll get to human work. Um, so um, when people are in a long-term relationship and they lose their partner, their partner leaves them, or they die, or they break up, or whatever, that increases mortality in people. It increases cardiovascular disease. It decreases immune function. It has a lot of physiological uh, responses, OK? And um, so we wanted to study that, losing a partner. And so we had males who were just hanging out with their brother, or males that were with a female, and they made it and pair bonded. So they both were in a social situation. And then we either let them stay with their brother or stay with their female partner, or we separate them from their brother and separate them from their partner. And then we did behavioral tests that measure um, um, behaviors that are consistent with depression. So immobility in the force swim test or hanging in the tail suspension test. And what we found is that in males, if they were separated from their partner, if they bonded and separated with their partner, you put them in a force swim test, they spend more time immobile. They're passive. They just give up. Okay? And it's not just social isolation, because if a male is away from his brother, he's very active. So this is uh, losing a partner is very, creates a depressive like response. And um, also tail suspension test. So this is amount of time hanging passively. I give up. Lost the partner. They just give up. Um, living alone for a few days, no problem. So this is really. So this means that something is happening, and the animals form a bond that, when they're away from that individual, it's really aversive, and it creates. If it, if it, if if they don't uh, get back together, they just depressive like behavior. And I think that this is actually an adaptive process in the wild that maintains the pair bond. Because when they go out foraging every day, they could just find another female and mate with the other female. But actually, there's a negative thing about it's a withdrawal. It's just like addiction. This is what, so an addiction involves dopamine and excitement in the beginning. But we know that relationships, if you've been in a relationship for, say, 10 years or so, you know it's not quite as exciting anymore as it was in the beginning. And uh, what reminds me of like I, I have I just had my 13th day anniversary with my wife, and uh, before I, we got married, actually I got a dog. And in the beginning couple of years, when I would come home from work, 
she would be excited. Both my dog and my wife would come up and they'd greet me and be both <laughs> equally excited to see me. And now when I come home, my dog is still very excited to see me, but my wife doesn't even recognize that I'm there unless it's like take out the trash or something. So we, we've been trying to understand uh, what is involved in this. And one thing that we noticed is that when these animals lose their partner, their adrenal glands get larger. There's increase in, CR, in um, ACTH and cort corticosterone. Um, there's increase in CRF expression in the brain. And so we found that if you, uh, several years ago, Oliver, um, from Germany, but he did this in my lab, uh, blocked central CRF2 receptors and showed that if you block those receptors, the animals no longer show this depression. So it is a CRF signaling cascade that is occurring. And that's involved in depression and stuff anyway. So it's also involved in, in addiction and withdrawal. Very, I think it's very parallel with withdrawal. We wanted to know where are CRF neurons. And we were surprised to find that in the PVN, the prairie vole, CRF, 100%, well, 99% of oxytocin neurons and the fibers that go to the nucleus accumbens have CRF receptors on them. So CRF seems to be activating the, uh, well, uracortin is probably the ligand here, or CRF, I don't know. But the CRF2 receptors are modulating oxytocin neurons. And um, if we infuse either um, CRF agonists, so we replicate what happens when we think, so CRF2 receptor agonists, it shuts down the release of oxytocin. If you give the antagonist, which, cause, which prevents them from being depressed, it increases the amount of oxytocin. And um, this should be 2017. This is not published yet. Um, oh, no, this is published. So there is a, a paper on this. This, but this is a, a slide from a review paper that we just published. If you um, give them vehicle, they, they um, get depressed. If you infuse oxytocin into the nucleus accumbens, it prevents them from showing depression. And actually, if you infuse into the nucleus accumbens oxytocin antagonist, even if the animals are paired, so they can't get the signaling of oxytocin from their partner, they actually show an elevation in this depressive-like behavior. So somehow, oxytocin signaling is involved in keeping the animal from being depressive-like state due to social interaction. So this is a nice um, connection between um, um, the CRF system and the um, oxytocin system. And actually, the paper that we, that we published in 2006 showed that that's not the only thing. There's actually multiple hits to the oxytocin system when the animal loses their partner. And it can be found in this paper, but we just submit, uh, submitted a review. Um, and I put that there, because if you want to see this when it comes out, I tweet it. Um, but there's, there's uh, the animals, when they're paired, they have lots more oxytocin synthesis, mRNA, loss of a partner. They stop synthesizing much oxytocin. There's a lot of CRF released, binds to CRF receptors in the nucleus of Cummins, prevents oxytocin from being released. And there's lots of more oxytocin present in an animal when they are together. So um, lots of uh, components of the, uh, and there's, there's more receptor. If, when they lose their partner, they actually have a decrease in oxytocin receptor content. So the whole system is designed to basically shut down when they lose their partner. And I think that that creates sort of the yin and yang of pair bond, which is uh, on one side, the beginning, the exciting exhilaration, the formation of the bond involves a lot of oxytocin during mating, but also the dopamine. And that's involved in the formation of the bond. But over a longer period of time, sort of the dark side of it is that oxytocin uh, minus oxytocin, the loss of oxytocin when you travel away from your wife uh, is aversive and makes you want to go home. Okay. When that empathy paper came out, people were like, uh, the press would ask me, God, voles, they seem like people. And I wanted to, you know, I, this is one of the comments that I made that I think is important to know that to think about is we should think of ourselves as part of a continuum with animals. Animals have um, um, Basic fundamental underlying neural mechanisms that cause them to engage in behavior similar to what we do. So I say these voles, they're not in love. They don't love each other, but they're bonded. Humans love each other because we bond using the same mechanism, but we have a cortex that allows us to make it a much richer experience. 
empathy, the same thing. So there's a lot of automatic processes that occur that we are unaware of. And then our cortex is what gives us the unique human experience. Now, um, I want to tell you some stories that show, suggest that similar kinds of things are going on in people. Uh, Hasa Wallam, who was at Karolinska at this point at, when he did this study, uh, found that a genetic polymorphism in the intron of the oxytocin receptor uh, predicted um, whether um, predicted the, the pair bonding behavior in humans with samples of like 3,000 people. Okay, so in humans, what version of oxytocin receptor you get predicts some aspects of the quality of the romantic relationship between couples. This is a, a neat study that was done in Germany, and this is a picture of my wife, um, who I'll see tonight. And um, I'm showing you this because in this study, they gave men in monogamous relationships, or at least they said they were monogamous, they were, they were in a good, good relationship. They gave them either in, uh, intranasal oxytocin and they gave them placebo. So they gave them both at different times. And they showed them pictures of their wife or partner and, or another woman who a bunch of college students rated to be equally attractive as their wife. Uh, and then they showed them pictures of uh, maybe a friend. And then they gave them oxytocin and they asked them to rate them on a score from 1 to 10. And um, so under placebo, if a guy says his wife is like a 7, um, when he got the intranasal oxytocin, he rated her a 9. So oxytocin increased how he rated his wife, but it did not increase how they rated the attractiveness of other women. So it's not just the women are prettier, or I'm more generous with my scores. It is specific for their partner. And what's cool is that they did this in a brain scanner so they could see what parts of the brain were activated specifically in the, in the situation where the man got the oxytocin and they were seeing pictures of the wife. And he found that the hot spots for these two little areas uh, right here, which is actually the ventral striatum, which is exactly the area that I showed um, earlier in the voles that is involved in pair bonding. So somehow oxytocin is activating the nucleus accumbens when these, um, in a people, when they see their partner. And that goes along with this idea that the neural ensemble that encodes the identity of your partner is actually hardwired into the nucleus accumbens um, striatum. So some evidence. Uh, we found a paper, um, I'm sorry, we, we published a paper um, in PNS that um, found that polymorphisms in the oxytocin receptors associated with face recognition skills. So mice use olfaction, we use faces, and variation in oxytocin receptor gene predicts how good we are at telling faces apart. Again, this is this idea of it enhances the salience of social stimuli. If we look at where oxytocin receptors are in rodents, it's all along the olfactory processing pathway and then into the hippocampus and nucleus accumbens. If we look in primates, including humans, it's in areas that are involved in uh, visual attention. The nucleus basalis of Maynard is really low, high, high density of oxytocin receptors, and that's cholinergic brain area that increases the signal to noise in a lot of brain areas, and I think that's critical for what oxytocin is doing. Um, so, yeah, that was 2014 PNS paper. Um, again, about this functional connectivity, this is a study came out last year, and um, this is like number of risk alleles of oxy so oxy polymorphisms in the oxytocin receptor have uh, and been associated with um, Sometimes the diagnosis of autism, but more likely some endophenotype of autism. And this is Dan Geshwin's work where they looked at, or actually not, not his work, it's this person's work, not that he's on the paper. Um, they, um, how many alleles of the uh, risk alleles do you have? And looking at functional connectivity in autistic groups, the more risk alleles, the less functional connectivity between the nucleus accumbens and prefrontal cortex area. So very similar to the oxytocin receptor SNP story that I showed you in the bowls. Um, there's hundreds and hundreds of th thousands now papers published giving intranasal oxytocin to people and seeing what it does. And I think that more than half of those are crap. Um, and I'll tell you why later. But um, the one consistent finding that is replicated many, many times is this looking into the eyes of others. It increases the attention into the eye to the eye regions of others. And the eyes is where we get information. We all look each other in the eyes for some reason. It's not random. I mean, we, we look into the eyes. Um, autistic people don't look into the eyes that much. Um, 
but we do, and we get that information. And the studies have shown that intranasal oxytocin increases eye gaze, um, face and emotion recognition, attraction to the partner. And now there's a lot of studies showing that it has a lot of acute studies showing that giving oxytocin to people with autism activates the nucleus accumbens and the functional connectivity of the accumbens with the prelimbic cortex and things like that. It increases, especially when they look at social cues. Um, and in acutely increases eye, eye contact and does a lot of things that you might want to do with autism. And um, but I want to point this study. If you're interested, if you're enamored by all of the intranasal oxytocin studies that say that makes you do all kinds of things, um, at least uh, in the healthy subjects, uh, the effect sizes are so small that the probability of people finding these, the results that they find is really almost implausible and that there's really probably a lot of negative results out there that and people are cherry picking all of their data to find the one thing that's significant and then building a hypothesis around that or not publishing things, the negative results. And in fact, there is a paper that came out after our paper calling empty the, emptying the file drawer where a lab just did a meta-analysis of all of their intranasal oxytocin studies and basically come up to the conclusion that there's not much there, actually. Uh, and, and why is that? So when um, intranasal oxytocin, um, maybe some of it gets into the brain. But when I inject oxytocin into the amygdala of a mouse or a vole, it doesn't make it to the nucleus accumbens. You know, we, pharmacology, behavioral pharmacology, we do injections in places, and the drugs don't diffuse that far. And um, it's hard for me to believe that maybe injection, I mean, cocaine does, I guess. You know, you, inject, you sniff cocaine, but uh, I just don't think very much oxytocin is getting into the brain. It's certainly not having the effect that happens in a mother when she's nursing her baby, and that baby is very special. The people who get intranasal oxytocin don't know they are getting oxytocin. I mean, they can't feel any different. Um, so I think that the problem is that maybe there is a real effect here, but the problem is that they're not, um, we're not reaching the deep areas of the brain that happens during an intimate moment or during a, um, so this is just one of the chronic studies where this was uh, intranasal oxytocin given to uh, uh, kids three to eight years old, 31, uh, twice per day, so before school, Take oxytocin, get on the school bus. Therefore, the things that happen on that school bus are going to be very salient to you, positive or negative. So, this, so far, all of the clinical trials have been done like, oh, oxytocin is like a vitamin. You don't have enough. Let me give you some two times a day. And that's going to make you more social. But what I've been telling you today is that oxytocin is not just something that makes you more social. It makes you perceive social information. And if that social information is a bully, you're going to perceive it that way. So I think this is a totally uninformed way of doing it. And all trials have done it this way. But here's one that's been published where you can see oxytocin, three weeks, giving twice a day, does improve um, the social responsiveness scores. But as clearly you can see, this is not a cure. It's some improvement. Um, so I've been working trying to figure out how can we harness the oxytocin system. I mean, we don't give serotonin to people who are depressed. But we do target the serotonin system. Most drugs, are, we don't give the endogenous molecule. In psychiatry, that would be ridiculous, right? Um, so we got to get beyond this intranasal oxytocin stuff. And the um, way I've been thinking about it is if you take, if you know something about the oxytocin neurons or how they're regulated, you might be able to identify some receptor that's on those neurons. And there may be a drug available that you can give um, that would cause those neurons to release oxytocin directly into the brain. And it turns out, uh, Gareth Lang, many years ago, found that if you take a rat slice and you squirt on some alpha MSH, melanocyte stimulating hormone, you get a robust release of oxytocin from the dendrites, but not in the terminals. Only around the dendrites, somatodendritic release. And if you give them a melanocortin receptor for antagonists, you don't get that. So now we've got a receptor that causes brain oxytocin release, but only local release. So we decided to give this drug. Um, well, we, we gave a drug, melanotan-2, is a drug that um, if you inject it into your, um, if a man injects it into himself, he gets an erection. But um, they also it also causes tanning. So in Australia, they've been using it for tanning purposes. But those are side effects. But um, 
lower doses, I think you can manipulate the oxytocin system. Actually, if you inject a rat with oxytocin, you get rats get an erection. Oxytocin is the most erectogenic molecule. And um, but normally, sniffing when you sniff oxytocin, you don't get an erection. So it shows you're not getting very much. But what happened here in the bowls? If we just give them this drug and put them together um, without mating for just six hours, it would induce a pair bond. And that was oxytocin dependent. If we blocked oxytocin receptors, they would not pair bond. Um, cool thing is, is that if you put them together under this drug, single injection IP, so we're not having to drill holes in the head anymore. You give this drug to IP and you let them be together for six hours and then you separate them for a week and then do the partner preference, they still have the partner preference, which means that the social information that was learned under the influence of the drug is still there after the drug is gone. So you're enhancing social learning. Now the last few data slides here, um, we wanted to see what parts of the brain are activated by this drug. So we injected this lonely vole sitting in a cage by himself with uh, the drug and then looked at CFOS and we found not very much activation. We found some activation in the amygdala, but uh, PVN was up as well, uh, but not much was going on. And we thought, well, that's because Oxy, the oxytocin is being released somatodendritically, not through the dendrites. And what that's doing is making the animals hypersensitive to social stimuli, to stimuli that would evoke oxytocin release. We showed that uh, with microdialysis. So we then did an experiment where we give them the drug and then give them a little bit of social contact. So 20 minutes of another animal. Not sex, but just social interactions. And what we find there is that this drug robustly activates the prefrontal cortex and the nucleus accumbens and the PVN, this whole social circuit, social saliency circuit in the context of a social interaction. And that is all oxytocin receptor dependent because if we co-infuse an OT antagonist, you block it. So that means that we now have a drug that will, in the context of a social encounter, um, activate the oxytocin system in a super physio, you know, more than normal way and um, activate these reward systems and everything. And I believe that in psychiatry, we should use this in the context of what really works in treating autism, which is behavioral therapies. So types of behavioral therapies that involve reinforcement learning, um, ABA or some other kinds of therapies that we're you know, using reward, it's, it's that, that maybe this drug can clarify Give some clarity to the social brain. It's like people with autism or have a foggy uh, windshield in front of them. And that for at least for the moment, or the, the hour or so when they are in a therapy session, we can defog that window and have them get more benefit from the behavioral therapy. And the things they learn during that time, they will um, retain because it's a memory. It's not a vitamin. Okay? That's my story. And, uh, of course, that was done by a lot of people. And then if you're interested in reading the book I wrote, that's the information on the book. And this is my, me and my wife and our family uh, 13 years ago. <laughs> well, thanks very much uh, for just a wonderful, very elegant presentation. Uh, I know there will be lots of questions, but I want to get the most important one in first. And um, some of us are interested also in the endocannabinoid system. Mm. What, you didn't mention that particularly, yes. and do you want to make any comments as to what its role may be in this whole process? Ah, no, I don't. Uh, I don't no. want to make some, because I, 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 know that there, I know that there are uh, papers out there now that have looked at the endocannabinoid system and oxytocin release. Um, I, mean, just, I, I didn't mean to ask a test question. Yeah, it's just, yeah that is a test yet. question because no, no, uh, sorry. the answer is out there and I should know that as an oxytocin person. No, but I sometimes I, you, have, you have to limit your scope of uh, right. things sorry. that you try to understand. Okay. My bad. But Let's move on. on. PubMed it and you'll find it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, let's start over here, Barbara. Well, of course, very elegant work. Thank you. Um, it, the role of oxytocin in coordinating social cues reminds me of the role of melatonin in coordinating circadian signals. Mm -hmm. And I'm inter it's interesting that if you take out the pineal gland and block melatonin, um, 
it also disrupts the social cues. So if you take a hamster seasonally breeding and you take out the pineal gland, then the males try to mate in the middle of winter when mm -hmm. and then yeah. which is not an appropriate time. Right. And then they get eaten by a predator instead. Yes. yes. Um, so I was really, you know, I wondered if there's an interaction between the circadian melatonin system. Mm -hmm. and Actually, so I don't know that, uh, but just to make sure that um, nobody's confused, the, this, the drug that I was, was mentioning is melanotan, which is not related to melatonin right. at all. But, right. um, but um, yeah, so I, I don't know the answer to that question. But I do know that um, like meadow voles who are solitary um, in the short day time, short day lengths, they actually do the females come together and group together. So uh, I think that there are, you know, uh, ways for the circadian or the you know system and the melanotonin, melanotonin mm -hmm. system, melatonin system. Right. I'm confusing myself. Um, to influence this kind of social behavior that you're engaging. But I just haven't, I haven't studied that myself. But they don't, both seem to be blocked by glucocorticoids or yeah, maybe, CRF. Yeah. The other question I had, I remember a while ago, um, some work out of Mount Sinai was that if you separated, um, you know, uh, pups from the, and I believe it was rat pups from the mother, um, most of the offspring would die, but it was all, it was primarily males who died. Hmm not the females, and that was because of their uh, failed immunologic response, where huh. females have a lot, an enhanced immune system, mm -hmm. and the males didn't in that. Yeah, that's, that's what mice or rats or something? Yes. Right? Yeah. Right. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I didn't know that. Okay. Um, but, uh, yeah. yeah like one minute. Get, I got one, one more. more. Okay. <laughs> but, and thank you for your comments on, on the limits of the oxytocin. I remember years ago working with Phil Gold trying to give Intranasal oxytocin, and we could not measure it in the CSF. Right. And I mean, I was there administering it, make sure. That Into we get monkeys it. or humans? Humans. Oh yes. Yeah. Okay. Can I make uh, two comments that I wanted to make at the end of my talk uh, that I didn't? It's the um, the uh, one one is that we have now completed clinical trials with not melanotan two, but a molecule that's exactly like melanotan two, except it has a hydroxyl group on it. So somebody's patented that. And um, that drug, we were able to use it. We, so th we did the clinical trials in autistic patients in Australia with a guy who has done a lot of the oxytocin stuff. And um, one reason that we were pretty excited about that is that the company who makes this drug, um, at first they, they knew that, okay, this gives erections, but there's already Viagra, right? So you don't, that's, not, that's not the indication that we want to go for. Uh, what they found is that it increases sexual libido in women, postmenopausal women. So they are going to get, they have done third, uh, phase three clinical trials successfully that this drug enhances sexual libido in postmenopausal women. And in their trials, the, the women um, give, give the EpiPen-like administrating device to their husband and they inject it and that becomes part of the whole foreplay kind of thing. And so that company now is worth overnight like many hundreds of millions of dollars. And now we might be able to use that for office. <laughs> What's bogus? It's bogus? Yeah. All right. We're moving on. Okay. So tell me why it's bogus. So Larry, a, a very elegant talk. Um, so another a clinical condition where there is a hypercorrelation of activ activity in the uh, prefrontal and the Cummins regions. Uh, is OCD. Mm -hmm. And uh, Brain Lock was a book written by Jeff Schwartz, one of our former residents here, who you know, talked about the hypercorrelation of the corticostri limbic corticostriatal circuitry and its outputs, and how you could then, if you interrupted, if you treated the disease effectively either with behavior therapy or pharmacology, that you lost that hypercorrelation in those regions. By so, hypercorrelation, you mean uh, correlation in activity? Yeah, metabolic activation. So. Um, so, and, and, and it struck me in, in looking at the empathic response of your voles that there was a sort of a checking and grooming that was going on there, two things that you see a lot in, 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 yeah, in, in OCD. 
Uh, and then the flip side of it is that one of the classic uh, harm obsessions that you see, uh, particularly in young mothers, uh, is the obsession that they might accidentally kill their child. Um, and, and so I was wondering if you if you thought through the connection between uh, the same circuitry, the same behavioral phenomena, and the same uh, psychological phenomena as a, as a, as it relates to OCD. That's another tough question um, that um, I have not thought too much about. But but you're right. So oxytocin, if you give to a, um, a, a mouse or a rat or anything oxytocin, uh, they do groom more. Um, and I don't know if that's related to OCD or not. But but yeah, you're right. So mothers are, are obsessed with their with the child and constantly checking in. With that. So there may be there may be some connections in the similar kinds of circuitry, and then how that how that goes awry, uh, precisely goes awry, I don't know. Um, so, so it may be that sort of coordinated activity in some way, in some, some kind of uh, special neural, organized neural circuitry way is good. But then if, it, if it's not in that kind of perfect organization, uh, you, you lose the, the sort of the elegant control of the ensembles that are communicating with each other, then you might get something that is pathological. Right. Well, certainly the, there is an element of obsessionality within attachment. Uh, and certainly, you know, the people have thought, talked about the love obsession and all that. So there's the, the two are not completely inseparable. Yes. Yeah, certainly when people have teenagers and when they fall, when they're in love, they are definitely obsessed. <laughs> or they're also addicted. So, yeah, I want to echo that I really enjoyed the talk a lot. Um, you know, a lot of the behavioral genetics work that's done in animals is done in mice and rats, and they're very distantly related to wild populations, right? Because they've been through these weird selection bottlenecks where they were first pets, and then they've become lab animals. There's been a lot yeah. of inbreeding, and a lot of nonsense goes on. And when we see a huge effect allele, like your oxytocin receptor polymorphism, right, that, you know, has this incredibly strong effect on the receptor and on the, the behaviors controlled by that receptor, my first assumption is that's probably a mutation or an incredibly rare allele from the ancestral population that got amplified by our selection, you know, that we did to make lab but animals. Not in this case. But here you have this great situation where you've recently sampled them from a wild population, you've maintained them as outbred. And so you can ask the question that you started to address. You said you have wild samples and you're going to use those to break up the LD. But the other question that you can ask then is, what is the role of this thing and what is the selective pressures right. for or against this yes. hugely effective oxytocin polymorphism in the wild populations? Because it's got to right. be, I mean, it's not going to be selectively neutral. Right. And there are signatures of selection you can get right. from those. So uh, also one thing that I failed to um, say in detail in the beginning, we don't have time to talk about everything, but in the wild, 60% of males form these pair bonds. 40% don't. So it's like people. Not everybody, not every man you know is married, or a woman you know is married. Some people don't do it, whatever. So, um, so those guys are called wanderers, and they um, often have babies. And so, if you genotype babies in the wild, um, some fraction of the babies, like ten to twelve percent, a similar fraction, a number that is in humans also as well, um, or don't belong to the role who's the pair bonded to the female. And my former postdoc, he's done a lot of this work in the field of the animals, that males that have a very tight territory um, with a female, um, those males often, all those babies are her, or his. Males have a loose territory and maybe sometimes mate with this female over here. Uh, he has a, a reproductive advantage, but his female sometimes gets pregnant by another male. It's like a postman effect. and um, the, so yeah, so so there is it's population density, lots of different variables that determine which behavioral strategy is the most uh, adaptive, and that may change, you know, over decades in the environment, or you know, like so these guys grew up in the tall grass prairies, and now there's no longer tall grass prairies there, and, and things like that. So I think that in the wild, what you see is a diversity. And that diversity is maintained because from time to time, different times, different strategies are better. And so, but I have a sample. And the other thing I wanted to say is that the brains that I have from the wild animals are from the studies that were done by my postdoc and his postdoc, former postdoc, um, 
Alex Ophir and Steve Phelps, where they showed that um, the animals that have the that are that are, are bonded in the wild have higher nucleus accumbens oxytocin receptors than the ones who are wanderers. They have lower nucleus accumbens oxytocin receptors, but they didn't do the genotype. So we have the genotype now, so we can we can make that connection, and that would be very cool. Um, you didn't say much about the cellular and molecular mechanisms here, so I'm just wondering a few questions. Say what you like um, on excitatory neurons, inhibitory neurons. I assume it's a GPCR, the receptor. Yes. Are there a bunch of receptors? What What do you envision it doing, sort of within the circuit? Is it making cells more excitable? Uh -huh. Is it changing yes. plasticity? So a lot of possible okay. things. Uh, so let me uh, let me tell you about some. Electrophysiological studies that have been done in mice that I think is that I use as a sort of a reference for how it might work in voles. That we have, since we haven't, I can't tell you what is happening in the nucleus accumbens yet, but we're looking to see if they're on D1 cells or D2 cells and stuff like that. But the cool thing that's been done with mice is um, cortical oxytocin receptor neurons that project down to the olfactory bulb um, are excitatory. Oxytocin excites them; it increases their excitatory drive. Um, onto the granular inhibitory cells. Okay, and those inhibitory cells silence mitral output cells. So if you think about the olfactory bulb, has a lot of mitral cells projecting out to the amygdala, and neurons are never are not just silent until they get a signal. They bump, 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 and then you get it's, then you get a signal comes in. So it's like the old television stations where you would have static. And then the image would be behind it to come in, and you'd have to look kind of hard through the static to see the image. Well, what oxytocin does when acting on these guys is, an, is it an, is inhibitory of the olfactory bulb, quietens down the olfactory bulb so the static goes away and the signal can come through more clearly to the next place. Now, there's another example where that happens in the auditory cortex in females, where uh, it's a, oxytocin changes the excitatory inhibitory balance. There, so that a mouse olfactory bulb, I'm sorry, a mouse auditory cortex responds selectively to pup calls. Um, they, virgin females don't do that. Yeah, but if you give, if you optogenetically stimulate oxytocin terminals in the auditory cortex, it somehow, I don't quite understand how this works, but the, the details of it, but uh, the title of the paper is Enhanced Excitatory Inhibitory Balance. Um, allows the brain to perceive or, or electrophysiologically respond selectively to the pup calls that it would not do if it hadn't had that oxytocin stimulation. So I see that my view of oxytocin um, action all the way along the pathway is to uh, maintain the high integrity information um, with the minimal amount of noise. So that as you pass from brain area to brain area to the areas that need to do stuff, like maybe the hippocampus or the nucleus accumbens, it'll, it makes it easier for the synapses to form. But yeah, I mean, that sounds like a very specific attentional mechanism, or not even attentional, where you're shutting off other sensory yes. inputs. You, you're more focused on the, mice, yes. the pheromone exactly. and the, you know, the pup calls. Right, so my, like my uh, sort of the overall Hypothesis of my center is that oxytocin enhances the salience of and the reinforcing value of social information by uh, facilitating the flow of that high integrity social information through the brain. It's not the hug drug or the moral molecule. So if I if I heard you right, uh, you were suggesting that. Oxytocin is linked to recognition, social recognition, and in voles that may olfactory and in humans visual. <clears throat> what about humans who have impaired vision? Uh, impaired vision from from the beginning. Okay. Um, well, is it, would would that be linked then more to acoustic uh, recognition? Yes. So, uh, so I, I didn't say that it all. In rhesus macaques, where we've mapped it out in detail, it is in parts of the brain that are involved in auditory processing. Um, so, because we do use vocal cues too, I recognize my wife and uh, everything. 
Um, we, we use smell. We probably use smell. We use smell too. I mean, uh, we don't use smell today because we we take a shower every day. But if you've ever been to a place where people don't take showers every day, there is a smell to people. So we just uh, we we just forget about that. But um, um, another kind of uh, oxy, very potent oxytocin stimulation is social touch. Okay, so if you do an experiment, so if you if you rub yourself like this, or like this, and then have someone else rub you like this, it feels very different. And it's a C fiber stimulation, um, and a social C fiber. It's a little giant now, um, <laughs> but uh, but touch, you know. So from an infant standpoint of touching the mother and all of that, but touch is a very potent releaser of oxytocin. We don't know much about how that works. But you know, monkeys, so for example, rhesus, they don't bond, but they have very strong social relationships. Um, and that is really maintained a lot through grooming each other. And um, so, so vision is not, so just like vision, you know, when people are blind, they learn how to adapt to the world through other sensory modalities. Um, those other sensory modalities also are linked to the oxytocin system, and I bet you that <clears throat> those get strengthened. Uh, maybe you mentioned already, uh, does vasopressin or its receptors have any role in social recognition? Yes. So vasopressin receptors are involved in social recognition, and I have a whole other talk I could give about vasopressin receptors. But I'll give you the very short version. Here I talked about oxytocin, which is sort of quintessential maternal hormone. It's a nurturing bond molecule in all species. And in voles, it becomes linked both in males and females to the nurturing bond between partners. Vasopressin in other species is involved in territoriality and aggression. So that aggression that that male showed in that video, that is due to increased vasopressin. Uh, vasopressin gives you vigilance um, um, and territoriality. In hamsters, it's been studied a lot. They scent mark. Vasopressin is an antidiuretic hormone. It makes you retain urine. And if you have a dog, you know that the way the dog scents his territory is he saves up all his urine until you take him for a walk, and then he pees on everything he can possibly find. So this molecule is also involved in the brain and territorial behavior. And I think that in males, that territoriality actually uh, became tweaked to become where the female becomes part of his territory. So the vasopressin aspect of the pair bond in male is that this is my female. And I'm going to, you know, I'm, don't nobody else mess with my female. But then the action with the female, the pro-social engagement with the female is oxytocin dependent. That's just my hypothesis. Makes sense to me. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, both for a wonderful talk and for this lively discussion. We appreciate your visiting with us. Um, and we have a tradition here. Uh, which is, I guess, a kind of social bonding thing.